Hello everybody, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight we're continuing in our study of the book of Proverbs. Uh, we're going to begin with chapter 23, verse, I think, 15. Uh, yeah. And, and if, if you have not seen the previous studies on Proverbs, I, I, they're uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I, I hope you will go back and, and watch this from the beginning. But before we get started, uh, let me ask our brother Eric and brother Stephen to introduce themselves. Hello, it's me again, the homo. Okay. Hey everybody, once again, it's Stephen, also known as Stephen Rivers TV here on YouTube. And as usual, looking forward to, you know, having good time, fellowship, studying the word. And of course, you know, talking the gospel at the very end. All right. Please subscribe to their YouTube channels. Okay, let's get started. Uh, I'm a KJV firstist, so we'll read each verse first in the KJV, and then we'll also look at it in the Amplified. Uh, verse 15, chapter 23. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Yea, my reins shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. Yeah, I think those two verses go together. Okay, so uh, respond to that, please. Uh, I am in agreement with those verses. Uh, as a father of three grown boys, this would be an admonishment to them. Okay, back to you. Well, I also agree with, you know, these verses here, you know, saying that, I mean, looking at it, you know, God definitely probably does rejoice, you know, over, you know, a, you know, wise one. And, of course, you know, okay, I think I'm starting to ramble, but it says, you know, when thy, you know, lips speak, you know, right things. So I guess it's just saying, you know, Watch your heart, you know, and your mouth, I guess, to some extent by looking at that. But definitely, you know, God does like to look on, you know, a wise person. All right. I found your uh, comments very interesting because uh, Brother Eric uh, answered it based on the, the premise that when it says my son, that it is King Solomon speaking to his son. I believe, and he, therefore he related it in the same way. He says, this is how I feel as a father. I want my sons to be wise, and if they're wise, I, it, that makes me really happy. Uh, then Brother Eric, uh, he took it from the perspective that when it says my son, this is God speaking to all of us, uh, and that God is pleased when we're wise. And I, I think both of these uh, points of view would be correct. Uh, let me look at it in the Amplified and see if uh, how they phrase it. 15 and 16 in the Amplified. My son, if your heart is wise, my heart will also be glad. Yes, my heart will rejoice when your lips speak right things. Um, my first thought, I, I, uh, I would have interpreted it the way uh, Brother Eric did. As, as though this is a father speaking to his son. Um, but once I heard Brother, Brother Stevens, uh, uh, the way he expressed it, I can see that it could it just as well apply in, in that way too. I, I'm not sure which way that uh, the, the writer intended it. But I suspect maybe because Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs and he said, several times throughout the book, he says he's writing this to his own son so that his son can gain wisdom. Okay, before I go on, anything else to say, be said about that? We can uh, go for a third one if you like, or a fourth, even a seventh. I don't think I have any additional comments to add as of this right this time. Uh, all right. Uh, I thought maybe you had another viewpoint on it, Brother Eric, but I think that was just another attempt at humor, wasn't it? 
Well, I can I can bring up another one if you like. I was thinking maybe uh, what if that was God talking to Jesus? Would it be necessary for God to say those things to Jesus? I don't I don't see how it would be applied to to Jesus, but in this case, but uh, um, my son, if thy heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Yea, my reign shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. Uh, when it says, my son, if thine heart be wise, uh, I don't see how that could apply to Jesus because there is no question about his wisdom. But, all right. Let me... Okay, I, I, I like how you uh, pinned it right down there on that if. Good job. Okay. All right, let me go on to the next uh, verse here. In the KJV, verse 17, Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Patience. Patience, young Patty Wan. Okay. Well, I definitely can't agree with that, you know, seeing patience, you know, when it says thine expectation should not be cut off. But as it says, you know, just let thine heart not, oh, sorry, let not thine heart, you know, envy sinners. So I guess that means, you know, you could, I guess, say, talk about that when it comes to like their way of life saying, you know, like don't, you know, envy that type of a lifestyle maybe. But of course, it says, be in the fear of the Lord, like, all the day long. Like, show, you know, the reverence, respect, you know, and pursue. Now, of course, you don't have to, you don't have to, you know, do your own works to be saved. But it's saying, this is wise to do those types of things. And that's what we should do. You know, not for our salvation, but for our own, you know, sanctification. Okay. Uh, but when it says... Uh... Let not thine heart envy sinners. Um, can you give me an example of anything about sinners and certain sins that might cause someone to be envious? Oh, wow. You know what? I All these false gospel preachers that are so successful, that would be very tempting for somebody to uh, want to uh, preach a false gospel so they could prosper. Okay. Well, maybe I could agree about you know the prospering part, but even though I personally couldn't see myself ever trying to preach a false gospel, but I guess when it comes to like trying to like maybe do things to like get wealthier, just like or other things to maybe like enjoy like this life, but just not in a want and like not in a good way. That's about all I can think of as of this, as of like right this second. Yeah, it, it, it seems like people who, or let's say they're they're gaining wealth, but through dishonesty. Uh, you know, you could be envious of their wealth, uh, but you know that the way they're gain they've gained it is not right. Um, we we shouldn't even if they gain wealth in the right way or in the wrong way, we should not really be envious at all. Of course. But it says, uh, apparently, sinners gain some things in life, whether it's sexual pleasures or whether it's popularity, uh, financial gains. A lot of people gain all these things that we think are good to have now, and yet we know that these are treasures on earth that don't last. And so... Um, it could be easy for to fall into for someone to fall into envy. Uh, I told uh, I told my brother today. Remember, I told you earlier when I golfed today. Uh, I met a, a golfer. I played with a golfer today, brother Max. Didn't know he was a brother until we talked for a while and just discovered that. But we. You know, we discovered that we're brothers, we love the Lord, we're saved, and so we're all happy to, talking about the Bible. And, and, and then he's, he told me uh, that he made a trip to Jerusalem, I mean, to Israel and Jerusalem. 
and he told was telling me all about it. And after he told me all about it, I said, Brother Max, I know I'm not supposed to be envious. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm, I'm envying you for, for your, um, your trip to Israel and Jerusalem. And uh, so it, it's, uh, I, it is natural, it's a, a part of our nature to covet, to envy, to be jealous of other people. And uh, you know, hope we don't want to do that, but but it's just part of being a human being. It's it's in that sinful nature that we have. But uh, I was happy for him. Uh, but then in this verse, we're talking about people gaining something through sin and envying envying it. And this verse is saying is no, it's better to fear the Lord. Don't don't worry. Don't be envious of their ill-gotten gain. If you're better off. Having fear of the Lord, respect the Lord, uh, be focused on the Lord, and then you will build up treasures in heaven. I think is what we're we're supposed to learn from this. Uh, the second part of it, I don't remember what it said. Let me go back to that. Um, For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. For surely there is an end. I mean, it makes me think of uh, well, our lives end. And we, we we're not going to be. They can't take that with them. Uh, so let me let me read it in the Amplified and see how that interprets it. Uh, Do not let your heart envy sinners who live godless lives and have no hope of salvation, but continue to live in the reverent, worshipful fear of the Lord day by day. Surely there is a future and a reward, and your hope and expectation will not be cut off. So I, I think it is taking it in that way that uh, uh, don't be jealous of people's uh, what they have right now, uh, even that they got it through sinful conduct and they seem to be prospering, uh, and yet we know that moth and rust is going to destroy their treasures, but our treasures are eternal. Before I go on, what's your comments? Brother Luke, I was wondering, what is our official doctrine on the fear of the Lord? Well, we don't fear the Lord uh, in terms of uh, salvation. We know that we have the blessed assurance. We are guaranteed we're going to go to heaven no matter what we do. From that point we trusted Jesus, that point on, uh, there's nothing, nothing that we could possibly do to lose our salvation. So we don't fear loss of salvation. We don't fear the second death in the lake of fire. But what we do fear is is the spankings that we we're going to get if we if we get out of line the god's chastisement and we also take the word to fear to mean respect and reverence and it, it mean it means that we should always keep respectful and, and revere god and that's why the word reverend uh, i i object to the use of the word reverend uh, you, you've probably uh heard of people that Sometimes they're quite famous, and this is the Reverend Al Sharpton. This is the Reverend Jesse, Jesse Jackson or something. I, I object to anybody taking the title Reverend because that means one that's revered. And uh, uh, we, I don't think we should be revering anyone but God. We should love each other, but our reverence is reserved for, for God. And, and so I would say that the fear of the Lord is the reverence of the Lord and the fear or, you know, we should always keep in mind that when we get out of line, he, he will discipline us because we're his children. Okay, Stephen, what do you think? Well, I definitely agree with that last statement he said about, you know, like the reverend. And, of course, you know, there, of course, churches give many titles that, you know, we don't agree with, especially father, except that one's much more explicit because... You know, Jesus spoke about that on his own. But I definitely, when it comes to, like, you know, reverence, though, you know, as a Christian, you know, as someone, you know, who has accepted Jesus and, you know, who believes in him, you know, we all, you know, do, you know, have a lot of reverence for the Lord. And, of course, you know, we all do get chastised, and, you know, no one wants to, but, you know, it's for our own sanctification. But, of course, for the people who are unsaved, 
the fear of the Lord is death. You know, the second death, not just, you know, the first death. But we definitely should be walking in reverence because, I mean, at least that's just what I you know, say on this. You know, Jesus, you know, do, you know we have a mission for G, from Jesus, and, you know, I feel as that, you know, that we should be carrying that out. Of course, if we fail to, you know, you know, we can go without working and still be saved, but I feel, you know, that's just our call and that, you know, that's what we should be doing, you know, in our lives. All right. Uh, I want to respond to that, but first, Brother Eric, anything that, anything further? Uh, I was wanting you, Brother Luke, to expound on uh, the fear of the Lord as it applies to unregenerated man. Well, the unregenerate, uh, the, the fear of the Lord in that case would be the consequences of, uh, of not receiving salvation. You know, uh, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ and received the free gift of eternal life, the promise of, of uh, heaven, then uh, uh, and, and the, the, the consequence of, of uh, not receiving it is you end up in hell, which is the sec the lake of fire, which is the second death. So uh, that's, if you've never put your faith in Jesus, you are non-regenerate. You haven't been, your spirit has not been brought to life. You are not born again. Then the most important thing, the most immediate thing, the most urgent thing you should do is put your faith in Jesus right now, be born again, and then you never have to have to fear the Lord in terms of the consequence being hell, the second death, and the lake of fire. Um, but I wanted to, before, I have something I want to say about Stephen's thing, but it, I, let me not move on without Eric, anything else you want to say about that? Oh, I'm anxious to hear uh, your reply to Stephen. Okay. Uh, uh, the end of the Stephen's comment, uh, um, he was talking about working for rewards and, and versus working for salvation. And he did make the distinction correctly. For salvation, we don't work it for it. Jesus did the work already by living a perfect, sinless life and then giving us credit for it. And then he also paid the price for it by suffering, dying on the cross. He paid for it. And so uh, this salvation is not a reward for our good works. It's a gift through, a, through faith. But then, so what is the point of, of doing any works? Well, by, by working, and uh, like what we're doing right now, people could call a work. We're doing a Christian ministry work right now. We're... We're uh, fellowshipping, we're, we're studying the Bible together, we're teaching. And uh, why do we do that? Uh, well, Stephen says, don't misunderstand. Don't think that we're doing these works to try to work our way up to heaven. That's impossible. We're only going to heaven because of what Jesus did for us, not because of our efforts. So uh, that is a fact. But what I want to ask you is, even though this is technically a work, do you really consider this work? Uh, for me, I've never decided, after I got saved, I've never decided there's some work I, I really want to do or need, I must do and so I can build up my treasures in heaven. What, what I did was I just felt that the Holy Spirit, after I got saved, immediately started transforming me and by transforming me it started changing my desires and my attitudes and uh, it's been a lifelong process brother Stephen refers to it as sanctification that's where we start we grow and mature spiritually over a period of time and that's I know that's happened in my life but my point is the works that I've done, the works that we're doing right now, is not it's not like work. Because what would I rather do than have fellowship with my brothers and, and talk about Jesus and the Bible? It's not a work, it's you could call it a labor of love, 
But that's what happens when the Holy Spirit transforms your heart and your desires. You desire, you get pleasure in these things instead of the things that I used to seek out for pleasure. Now my desire is different and I, I gain pleasure through, you no, know, well, every night, every night I get to talk about Jesus in the Bible at 7 p.m. Pacific time. And I look forward to it. It's not a labor where, oh gosh, I'm obligated to do it. But I know I've got to do it because i got to be religious and make sure I show up and put my time in. There you go. I'll respond to that if you like. Well, there's another reason why the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news. I'm compiling a, 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 a list of reasons why the gospel of Jesus Christ is such good news. Okay. Demon. Yeah. Well... Okay, maybe I just misspoke earlier when I was talking, but um, but yeah, I mean, we only get saved because of you know what Jesus did on the cross. We can't contribute you know anything to salvation, you know. And Jesus said all we have to do is just believe on Him. I'll go into more detail on that in about thirty minutes when it's gospel time. But I guess when I was talking about works, I mean, you don't have to work any works to like go to heaven, and you know the Holy Spirit you know works with you, you know to help you you know in your growth. So Jesus is always with you, you know, all the time. You know, because without him, we can't do anything. I mean, let's be honest. It's through him that we have, you know, all our strength and, like, everything. But maybe I just went a little bit – I guess I just must have misspoke earlier when talking about works because, like, I guess I could consider this a slight work because I feel like I am working for the kingdom of God, you know, every time I present the gospel, you know, trying to win souls over for Jesus – but then again, I do it. I I enjoy doing this every night, though, because it's you know awesome to be able to fellowship, to be able to learn, you know, to be able to you know have things explained to me that I couldn't you know quite understand, and then of course the top you know capping it off by you know preaching the gospel. That's always the best part, and to just think that you know someone could have you know you know come to the conclusion that Jesus you know you know is Savior, and that they could have you know trusted Him. You know that's the best part, knowing that someone may have done that. So, like, it's definitely joy. So, if this is a work, I've got to tell you, I really, if spreading the gospel is a work, I love my job. I will say that, definitely. But, like, still, as, you know, as said, to him that worketh not, but, you know, believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So, I mean, anyone who's believed and trusted, they're already safe. That's the best part. I love that response. Well, I love the response, except that I'm afraid that he uh, he took my my comment wrong. Uh, I I I was not correcting you or uh, challenging your statement by uh, when you said you 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 said a couple times you thought maybe you misspoke about works. I wasn't disagreeing or anything. All I was is expanding on what you said. Uh, there was no correction there or reprimand or anything else. It was just uh, you didn't misspeak at all. I didn't see any correction in, uh, in there either, and I really liked how you emphasized uh, our occupation in Christ, which is eligible to everybody, and it's the greatest occupation in the universe. Okay, back to you. All right, I just misunderstood. All right, brother. Uh, let's move on now here to uh, verse 19. Hear thou, my son, and be wise and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Um, so that's about just the opposite of what we were talking about. That's the other side of uh, the coin. Maybe, huh? Well, I guess when you talk about, you know, not envy sinners, let's look around. Um, of course, it says guide your heart, you know, in a wise way, obviously. But it says, you know, not be among, you know, like people, you know, like drinkers or I guess, you know, gluttons. Because it's like, it's not a way that's like good for us. And it's not intended like, like as a way that we should be, let's say, doing things. But like, as it said though, too much drinking, you could like, and alcoholism could, 
you know, out of control if you, you know, do it wrong could really lead to severe consequences. That's why it says, you know, a guy being put in rags because you can see, like, bad things that happen. I mean, I'm not going to sit here, you know, and curse anyone because I don't know if any alcoholics are watching, so I'm not here to curse you guys. But, like, just bad things can happen, and it's just not a way that, you, like, you should be carrying yourself, like, in this type of situation. Yeah, when, when, uh, when Brother Stephen said, do not be among these people, uh, I, I when I first read the verse, that part of it didn't really click with me. I, I, I was thinking the verse was talking about, do not be a wine bigger, do not be a glutton, or you'll end up in rags. But this says, do not be among them. So uh, why would you not want to be among them? Well, I guess there's a few reasons. Uh, if you know you're you can be influenced by them, and then you end up becoming one. And also, if you're among them, even if you don't become a wine bibber, which is a, you know a person who's drinking too much, um, a glutton is a person that's eating too much. Even if you're not one of them, and you don't become one of them, still, what what you is that really a great use of your time? Just hanging out with people drinking and eating, and you know, and there's better uses of our time. But I will say that uh, there is a place for drinking and eating and relaxing and enjoying company with people, but we cannot make that our main occupation in life. It's just partying and having fun, you know. Well, what, as Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, it's all just vanity. He realized that, you know, having all the wealth and the, the wives and all these, these things that people were envying him over, that, that he realized that all those material things and ex essential experiences was just uh, um, what's the word again? And I just started. vanity of vanities. Yeah, it's just all it's vanity. Just, vanity. It's just uh, he, what's really important. He, Solomon realized, and I think we get from this voice verse here is that what's really important are spiritual things rather than material and carnal things. Um, let me look at it in the Amplified. Uh, verse 19. Listen, my son, and be wise, and direct your heart in the way of the Lord. Do not associate with heavy drinkers of wine or with gluttonous eaters of meat. For the heavy drinker and the glutton will come to poverty, and the drowsiness of overindulgence will clothe one with rags. So it's not only a mistake to be a, a drunkard and a glutton, but it's a mistake to just be hanging out with these people. There's better use of your time. All right, I'll go on now to the... KJV in the next verse is verse 22. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. That's always good advice. Very simple, straightforward. Yeah, I feel like you definitely shouldn't, like, abandon like your parents you know in any way of course like there are some people who have you know parents who don't do the best things or don't lead the best way or sometimes you know flat out abandon them but like in most cases like you know God said you know we should honor our father and mother so you know I just agree you know that's what just what we should do like pretty much yeah well you know uh, one of the things, uh, I've said this over and over, I guess I'll continue until we're all finished with the book of Proverbs. I'll, I'll continue repeating this this point. But the book of Proverbs is, I think, in a really unique book in the Bible in that it's not a historical account of certain events and people. Uh, it's it's a, a, a series of sayings. And, and some of these sayings or proverbs, um, it's one verse to teach us something. 
Sometimes there's a series of two or three or four verses strung together, but we're supposed to learn something from that and gain wisdom. And that wisdom will benefit us as we live out our lives. Uh, but, but many of these nuggets of truth, of wisdom, uh, they're repeated uh, over and over again about don't be lazy. Well, it's not the first time we've heard that one. Don't be a glutton. We've heard that one before, too. Uh, what about your parents? Be respectful of them. We've heard that before, too. So some of these things, obviously, you can say, well, I've heard that before, but these things are so important, they're worth repeating. So it's it's drummed into your brain, and you understand, wait a second, I'm telling you this over and over again because that's how important this is. Listen to your father. Respect your mother. Do not, do not uh, what was the word they used? Uh, to your mother, uh, says, uh, oops. despise not thy mother when she is old. Yeah. So, so you don't want to despise your mother. You don't want to ignore your father when he's trying to talk to you about something. I mean, these things are. Uh, you're going to hear it over and over again because it's that important. It's worth repeating. It, you know, if you didn't get it the first time, well, we're going to say it again and again and again. That's how important this is in our lives. Uh, let me look at that in the Amplified. That's uh, 20. Listen to your father who sired you, and do not despise your mother when she is old. Okay. All right, let's go to verse, uh, the next one, in the KJV. Uh, verse 23, buy the truth and sell it not, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. I think verse 3, verse 4 together. It says, The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. Yeah. And, you know, if you're watching this now, and and you're some a person that has not been respectful to your parents and you you know it and you, you're feeling remorse over it I hope maybe this will prick your heart and you'll you'll go make amends with them and and, and show them the respect that they, they should receive and also if if, if you're a, a parent that has a child like that I, I, I feel for you I, I, and I pray that your child will be respectful to you I've been blessed in that my parents were wonderful, and my only son is wonderful. I, I don't have any of these issues, and I feel very blessed because I've I've met a lot of people, and it's it who have told me really sad, tragic stories about bad relationships between parents and children. Okay, I'll move on, and, uh, but first, go ahead and make your comments on that. And that gives me another reason why the gospel is such good news. Because it's never too rec late to reconcile with your loved ones. Okay. Well, for me, looking at, you know, the first verse of this, how it says to, what is it, buy the truth, you know, and sell it not. You know, partially sometimes when I think of the word truth, I think about, you know, like the gospel message. Because you can apply that, because when it says sell it not, that means, you know, don't just, you know, pitch it. You know, you know buy it, you know, and keep it. Like... You know, don't just, you know, hear the gospel and throw it away. You know, believe it, you know, and be saved. But, of course, also, you can apply that also to, like, now, when I, you know, see the, um, well, let's see, what is it here? Let me look back at it again. You know, wisdom, instruction, understanding. You know, at that point, also, you want to hold that to your heart, too. You don't want to just pitch that because otherwise it's just not going to be, you know, good for you, you know, in the future. And, of course, both, you know, when it comes to like that stuff, but especially the gospel, you know, a lot of people will definitely be rejoicing when you, because like the only way to be righteous in the sight of God is by the imputed righteousness, you know, given to you by Jesus, by, you know, what, what he paid for, the sacrifice that he did. 
And so there's definitely going to be rejoicing from, you know, your father in heaven. But, like, especially, like, if anybody else knows the Lord, like your parents, they would definitely also rejoice, you know, as well. But, you know, even, you know, to the earthly sense, they would also rejoice, you know, at least most would, you know, just by, you know, with a wise person. But then again, a lot of this is about, you know, fruit in the Lord as well, though. Okay, let me move on here. Uh... Uh, Brother Luke, uh, yeah, yeah. I really like Stephen's response, and uh, I just wanted to uh, touch on one more thing on that verse 23. That's a very popular verse. I've heard it many times, and there's many different interpretations for that. Uh, for the first part of that verse, buy the truth and sell it not. Uh, how would you respond to that? Well, I thought about commenting further on it, uh, not because I've ever heard anybody talk about it, because uh, uh, what you're referring to, I'm, I'm unaware of anything. Uh, but it just struck me when it says, buy the truth and sell it not, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. I remember in the first chapter or two of uh, Proverbs, it said a few times that uh, wisdom is so valuable it's more valuable than all gold or silver or precious gems um, wisdom and understanding and knowledge uh, that's how val valuable it is if it's that valuable then uh, uh, it, it's valuable enough for you to actually buy it if you can because um, like see here, what we're reading is, is here, and, and you can get one of these Bibles here online. You can read the Bible for free. There are all kinds of programs. Uh, the one that I'm using here is called Bible Gateway. I think that's what I'm using here. Yeah, Bible Gateway. So you can go to BibleGateway.com, and for free... Um, you can get the uh, you can get the knowledge and wisdom that we find in the Bible, um, but if you had to buy a Bible in order to uh, obtain that knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, then it's worth it to actually buy it. Uh, but uh, you know, a lot of people, they, they do spend a lot of money, and they'll go to seminars and how to be successful in life, uh, the seven principles of, of success, and, and they'll spend money learning from various gurus of success, and, and they, they invest in trying to gain wisdom so that they can understand how to be successful in life. Uh, so if you, it, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge is so valuable, it's worth it's saving and investing and buying it if you could, but the nice thing is it's available to you free in the in the Bible. Uh, but that's that's what I was thinking, brother. It probably is not relevant to what you had in mind. But go ahead, let, tell me what you were thinking. Well, I never really came to a conclusion myself on that. And uh, Stephen, I think nailed it. Uh, you get that gospel, and you never let it go. It's just like David said about Jerusalem, which we can compare to the gospel. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. Okay. The, the, the reason that I don't relate this verse to the gospel is uh, where it says, uh, by the truth. Um, the truth that we find in the gospel, uh, that's a free gift. You don't buy it. And this is where people a lot of times go wrong, thinking that they can buy their way into heaven. If they, if they pay their tithes, if they, if they make charitable donations, if they 
give money to helping the poor or something, that God will be pleased and they you know, buy in their way into heaven. So, but we know that's not the case at all. Uh, we cannot buy for buy salvation. Jesus already bought it for us, and He's given it to you as a free gift. And he, how did He buy it? He bought it with His blood. And the Bible says that God's own blood was 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 shed to buy us salvation. So, by suffering and His shed blood and His death on that cross, He purchased this salvation. Um, so that's why I don't relate this verse to salvation because it's telling you you can about buying it. Yes, brother Luke, absolutely. We know God that Jesus paid the price. It just so happens it's free, and that's another reason why the gospel is such good news. <laughs> yeah, I agree with brother Luke's statement because yeah, you know, there's definitely nothing you can do to buy the gospel. It's just the way I was thinking about it was when I thought of buy, I just thought about you like grabbing onto it. And you know, but that was just my way of saying it, but definitely there's nothing we can do to ever buy the truth. I mean, sorry, there's nothing we can ever do to buy salvation, buy the gospel, or do anything on our own means because you just did pay it all. So I definitely 100% agree with that. Okay, we'll go on now to the next verse. It says... Uh, Verse 24, the father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. That's really, really Go ahead. Well, that's interesting. The first verse... Uh... I agree with, and uh, then the second verse he goes on to address the the child that he was talking about in the in the previous verse. Uh, there I am. Um, yeah, a you know any father or mother would definitely you know rejoice you know in a wise kid, or of course in anyone who has found the gospel. But yeah, I know we already I think covered this earlier, but. Yeah, I definitely agree with both these verses. I think they're pretty straightforward as of right now. All right, yeah, it's straightforward, and as I said, it's redundant. We've we've made the point, and 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 I won't be surprised if the the concept of honoring your father and, and getting wisdom, and your father and mother will be happy, uh, that this this same point will be made again in in the other chapters. Um, verse 26 my son give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways for a whore is a deep ditch and a strange woman is a narrow pit she also lieth in wait as for a prey and increaseth the transgressors among men Okay, now we're getting into some serious stuff here. Okay, then. I guess it's my turn. Well, of course, looking at this, like, you know, this is, you know, from Solomon. So looking, like, at a wise way at this, at this point, at least, because I know he did fall later. But looking at this, though, he's definitely, at this point, you know, just warning you not to fall into, like, a sexual and more, you know, immoral lifestyle, like with the whore here, because it can really, really have a lot of, you know, bad consequences, you know, in your life, because it can really. I feel like you know the law of reconciling can definitely apply to something like that, because there's many, you know, ways, you know, like and consequences things can happen, you know, from like a, you know, immoral relationship that wasn't supposed to happen, but. It just mostly, you know, continue to just observe, you know, the ways of the wise one and just continue to, like, pursue after, you know, the godly ways, like, in this point. Well, um, th this subject we've discussed in previous chapters. But Brother Stephen wasn't here with, with me when I went through this uh, in prior chapters. So I think this would be uh, good to, to go into this a little more deeply 
but you talked about consequence. First of all, what is a strange woman? And and then uh, uh, what what are these consequences of being with a strange woman? I mean, you said there are some, but why don't you go ahead and elaborate further on what these consequences could be? Well, I mean, there's many things besides any disease that you could get, like from like a bad relationship. You could also end up, you know, getting someone, you know, pregnant, or you could also get caught in the act by like the, you know, husband or family and get into like some really serious trouble for it. And then plus, you know, it really can, you know, it can mess with you, I guess, like your, um, like the way of thinking in a way too. You know, besides that, like your spirit almost, because then it's like you've. Well, I mean, you've done something that you shouldn't do, obviously. But then again, of course, as I said, most of the consequences I think of is definitely like something like pregnancy, you know, getting caught and then getting, you know, whacked for it. Or, yeah, pretty much just stuff like that is what I think of because it can really cause like a lot of like problems with stuff like that. Well, this is a, a strange term, the term strange woman. Could you tell me what you think a strange woman is? I think of like... Well, I mean, just based on the context of this sentence, let me look at it again. I think about it, you know, being like maybe the, um, as it said, it's like the whore, like the adulteress. That's what I'm thinking of, but, like, what do you think about it? That's what I think, because it says right there, whore, right before it says strange woman. Well, uh... Strange, uh, if we add an R to the word, it's stranger, um, a stranger, a, a woman that's not your wife. Uh, we know that the Bible teaches us that uh, uh, for, for sexual relations, um, it, it's supposed to happen between one man and one wife, uh, one husband and one wife. Uh, that's... That's what the Bible tells us the, is the confines of sexual relations. Uh, and now, if you, if you have sexual relations with a strange woman, a woman that's not your wife, that's a stranger, that someone that's other than your wife, uh, well, obviously, if she's having sex with you and she's not married to you, then she would be called a a whore, because a whore is someone that's having sex outside of marriage. Some people might say that it's a whore is even further that it's a woman that does it continually. Uh, but the point is, this is sex outside of the uh, the confines of a marriage between one man and one woman. And when you when that happens, whether it's premarital or whether it's extramarital, if, if you're a married couple and then you have relations with a strange woman or if you're a wife and you have relations with a strange man, someone that's not your spouse, then uh, there's going to be consequences and the possible consequences are unplanned, unwanted pregnancies, maybe uh, you know, sexually transmitted diseases, maybe divorce, broken families, all these things come from it. All right, anything else before we move on? Yeah, you know, I think there are other consequences, really, really bad consequences that we haven't even considered for the Christian to fall into that. Uh, somebody might see that and uh, refuse to uh, receive Jesus Christ because of that. And so when this guy goes to heaven... Jesus will let him in, but he'll say, oh, by the way, uh, I have to kick this other guy out into hell because uh, you cheated on your wife. Uh, just thought you'd like to know. What do you think about that? I don't have, oh, I'm sideways, but I just don't have too many additional comments as of right this time. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's there's other potential spiritual consequences and salvific, salvific issues that, that could come from it, too. All right, well, I'm going to go on to the next verse. Um, uh, verse 29, 
Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eye shall behold a strange woman and thy heart shall utter perverse things. Well, I'll stop. That's verse 33. I think that's a new new idea there. So uh, through verse 32, the the uh, the wine biteth like a serpent. Um, it looks like one long tail up into the end of the chapter. Did you uh, want to just stop there rather than read the whole saga? Well, I looked ahead. I didn't think it was connected. I thought the wine was one subject, and then the the strange woman coming up was separate. Okay, uh, Stephen, what is, does that look like? It continues to you or not? Well, I mean, okay, looking at this one. Let's see. Thine eyes shall behold strange women. Well. Wine can make you do bad. Like getting drunk and like in this situation can definitely make you, you know, do things like that. But so I guess maybe in that type of a connection. But it does seem like it's a, a different idea because it is going on to about you know a lot now on like perverse things. But like the first one is talking about you know watch out for like your drinking pretty much, which is what like this one is saying when it comes to the wine. All right. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, um, I think that we've we've talked about this before, but I mean it, it's worth repeating. It, we, obviously, all these principles uh, they're they're so important that they're all worth repeating. But the idea of uh, being intoxicated with alcoholic drinks, wine. Today we have beer. We have various liquors. All of it's abundantly available. And it called it alters our state, and then it also can, in, in many people, develop into dependency and, and uh, alcoholism, uh, which will destroy your mind and your body and your family and your career. It ruins everything. Uh, so, uh, is it is it wrong to drink wine? You know, alcoholic wine is it is it wrong to drink it? No, no. I mean, the Bible we we know that uh, numerous times in the Bible it says that to don't drink too much of it. And we know that there's a lot of examples of Jesus and the the apostles and other characters in the Bible drinking wine and drinking it responsibly and enjoying it. Uh, but it's it's the type of thing that you must be very careful because it, it's not hard for you to get out of control with it and then it overwhelms your life and it takes everything from you. I mean someone told me a story once they said I, I knew this guy and, and he said that his his best friend uh, ended up taking his wife from him I and mean, it was a, quite a betrayal you know and it, his wife is gone because of his best friend and and, and, and then the uh, the best friend took his job from him. And then the be the best friend said, "I'm going to kill you. I'm going to destroy your health and kill you." And his his best friend was named Jack Daniels. And and that's what that's what alcohol and alcoholism does to people over a lifetime. It just takes everything from them eventually. And I've known people personally that I've seen that happen. So. My advice, my my advice really is just abstain completely. If you if you've never taken up drinking alcoholic beverages, if you've never taken up using recreational drugs, if you've never tried that, remain a virgin in that in that respect. Just abstain from it 100 percent, because uh, as soon as you taste it, whether it's alcohol or drugs, 
as soon as you taste it, uh, you don't know how you're going to respond. I mean, maybe you're going to be one of these people where it gets a grip on you and has you for the rest of your life and your whole life is ruined. So it's a, quite a gamble to even, even um, uh, risk it. Uh, but if you if you have been drinking, if you if you've been able to drink alcoholic beverages and you can do it in a recreational way and not get out of control, then it's not really forbidden in the Bible. Okay, anything else? Yeah, brother Luke, uh, life's hard enough as it is, and then go getting uh, hooked on some something that's going to make your life a lot more miserable. It's just not uh, very smart at all. Okay. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I would say that if, if you really want to get high, I suggest you get high on the Most High, God Almighty and the Holy Spirit. That's how I get high. <laughs> all right, I'm going to go to the next and final verses here. Uh, verse 33 thine eyes shall behold strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things yea thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast they have stricken me thou shalt thou say and I was not sick they have beaten me I, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. I think you may be right now that I've read those and may be connected to the uh, 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 drinking too much wine. It's a very sad story. I think we all know people whose lives have been cut short uh, terribly and painfully because of it. Yeah, alcohol definitely can do bad things, but of course it also talks about, you know, it can make you do like perverse things and just do, you know, foolish things, you know, in general that you'll just end up regretting the next day. It's like, you know, living in the moment for that night, but then you wake up the next day and reap the consequences, I guess. All right, okay, I would say that uh, uh, this is a very interesting study. Uh, we'll stop at the end of this chapter, and next time we study Proverbs, we'll, we'll begin the next chapter. Uh, before we go into the, the gospel message, uh, uh, each one of you just take a moment just to say whatever thoughts come to mind and regarding the study as a whole, if anything stood out to you. It seemed to have a theme uh, going on there. Uh, I can't remember what it was, though. Anybody? Help help me here. Well, I mean, what I see is it's just like pursue like the righteous way. Like don't do stupid things like, you know, like get drunk or, you know, have these, you know, bad relationships or allow your heart to like wander in that way or get influenced by, you know, people who do that type of stuff. But instead, you know, just set your eyes, you know, on the Lord and just, you know, just delight in him. All right, well, that, that's a good segue into the, the gospel message. Um, I'll set it up for you, Brother Stephen. Uh, when I say the gospel message, uh, the word gospel is a Greek word that just means good news. Um, and, and, and the good news is, is simply that uh, heaven is offered to every person on earth by Jesus Christ as a free gift. Heaven is a free gift. If, if you will receive it from Jesus. Uh, so uh, can you expand on that concept and, and uh, go, go, go through it a little more uh, completely? All right. Well, you know, there's a lot of, you know, definitely good news in what Jesus did for us. You know, and this is for anyone who might be in that type of situation, whether you don't honor your parents, whether you're a drunkard, whether you've had bad relationships, or whether your life's just a screw up in general. The good news is it doesn't matter how bad you are because Jesus paid it all for us. The good news is Jesus, who was 
God in the flesh, the God of this entire universe, you know, came down here in the flesh, you know, in the body, you know, and stood here on this earth where we are. You know, and while he was here, he lived the perfect life that was pleasing to the Father. He fulfilled the law and did everything that we couldn't do. He performed many miracles, you know, that proved who he was. But of course, the greatest miracle, which was ultimately, you know, he predicted this would happen, but was what he paid for our sins by dying on the cross, you know, being buried, you know, down in the ground, and then three days later, having, after being dead for three days, he rose again, proving, you know, that he was God, and proving that everything that he said was true, that he had the power to, like, lay life and take it back. You know, he did that. But the best part was, was when he died on the cross, because he shed his blood for us. He paid the ultimate sacrifice. You know, God put skin on and tasted death for us. You know, it's the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. And now, I will say this, there is no other way besides Jesus to get, you know, to get to heaven. As Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man will come to the Father, you know, but by me. So Jesus paid it all, and that's the only thing that God will accept. You know, we need his righteousness, you know, not our own. And he, and he gives it to us as a free gift. As he says in John 6.47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. You know, he paid it all, and he gives us, the, and he presents the gift, you know, to us. As it says in Matthew 18.11, For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. No matter how bad we are, no matter how disobedient we are, or you can insert anything into the blank, or even, you know, yeah, anything. You know, Jesus has paved the way for us, and we can, and the only way we can, you know, get to God and have our salvation is through him, you know, and through his righteousness. As, you know, the prisoner asked in Acts 16, 30 through 31, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Not only will you be saved, but you're also eternally secure. As it says in John 10, 28, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man ever pluck them out of my hand. And that's the best part. Jesus paid it all for us by dying, being buried, and rising again. We can't buy it. We can't work for it. But the work of God, actually, this is kind of weird that I guess I said that, but then I'm saying, you know, right, saying this verse, but it's saying, John 6, 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. All we have to do is just believe in Jesus. We can't buy the gift. We can't, you know, earn the gift. But instead, Jesus is giving it to us freely. And all we have to do is just reach out and believe and accept it. He paid it all for us. And no matter how bad we've been or insert in the blank, you know, he's given it to us. You know, salvation is, you know, believing, you know, the gospel, what Jesus did, plus, minus, nothing. So all, we, so all I would just say to everybody is tonight, everyone who doesn't know Jesus, definitely come to him. You know, come to him and live. And that's all I have to say. Oops. Uh, well, well done, brother. Uh, um, this will end the broadcast for tonight. Uh, I hope, uh, thank you everybody for, for watching. You can join us nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. I'm going to give the last word here to brother Eric. Uh, I'm very thankful that uh, God gave us his son, Jesus Christ, to uh, give us eternal life with him in paradise forever. And uh, I'd like to uh, just say a thank you prayer for those who have uh, received this free gift. You should know that uh, now you can come boldly to the throne of grace and talk to God himself. So let's just thank him for that. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and being buried and rising again the third day to give us eternal life with you in paradise and all our loved ones. We receive that gift happily. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, go love your neighbor as yourself. Back to you. 
Okay, brothers, thanks for joining me tonight. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.